Okay. Really doesn't need an introduction here because I think he trained several of you who are sitting here in the audience. But uh, Dr. Mark Josephson, you can read his title, Mark Josephson Herman Dana, Professor of Medicine, Harvard Medical School, Chief Cardiovascular Division at Beth Israel Decano. But this doesn't tell you much because I think Mark has made enormous contributions to the field of clinical cardiac electrophysiology. And I say clinical because he really brought understanding of mechanisms and uh, research mechanisms of cardiac arrhythmias and then brought this knowledge to the bedside and to the EP catheterization laboratory, which is really uh, something that distinguishes him. Uh, as I said, my contributions are enormous both to clinical and mechanisms of cardiac arrhythmias in patients. And in addition to that, he's been a master teacher of electrocardiography for many, many years, running a legendary course, course together with uh, Hein Wellens from Master. So we're happy to have you. I know you're exhausted after a long day, but this, now you can rest now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jorn. As I told uh, many of the people who I saw today, this is the one institution in the United States I always am envious. Uh, when I come here because of the great uh, basic science and translational research that goes on here. Uh, I'm really happy to see Jack Bueno sitting here uh, because he's one of the original pioneers. I don't know if many of you know the story of WPW. Everybody thinks this began at Duke and Andrew Wallace, but it began with Jack Bueno, uh, where he learned from Dr. Dura in the Netherlands in the early 70s, I think. Uh, early 60s. Early 60s. Uh, you're younger than me. <coughs> Anyhow, uh, I think that uh, I'm really happy to see you here. Uh, I'm going to talk today about substrate mapping uh, and its relationship to ablation for uh, untolerated uh, VT. Um, the reason that it is important is that conventional ablation, when, while I think uh, rather successful if you do things appropriately, uh, is good for tolerated tachycardias where you have time to map and train and uh, really do a good job. Uh, isn't as common uh, these days as unmappable tachycardias? There's a problem here uh, in that when you read the literature and you have numbers like only 10 to 25 percent of people with VT are mappable, that's because people include all the tachycardias they induce, which is not really fair. And I'll just say one thing that I won't repeat, is that if you have tolerated VT, your mortality is about 2.5% per year. If you have single vessel disease, it's less than 1% a year. So it doesn't matter if you induce other ingredients. I would say that before I tell you to go off and blade everything on the face of the earth that you can possibly induce. That being said, this is being done now. Uh, if you have unstable tachycardia, it's like what happens in most patients, and they have a uniform morphology. There is, uh, particularly people with cardiomyopathy, particularly people with multivascular disease and large infarctions, some of them will come back. And you need to know uh, how to deal with that. And most patients today, when we see them, already have an ICD in place. Uh, they have lots of comorbidities, heart failure, <coughs> leukemia, peripheral disease, pulmonary disease, thrombus. They'll, this limits what you're going to get out of the whole six hours or so that you will have to think about and do things about for this person. And in general, because they have uh, devices, the major reason you're asked to fix them is you don't want to get them to get shocked all the time because people getting shocked die sooner. You can't do detailed mapping, okay? So you need to look at the substrate. And there is a, a different substrate in patients who have cardiac arrest than those who have tolerated tachycardia. So many years ago, uh, <coughs> more than I'd like to think about, almost 30 years ago, we looked at this. We looked at the differences in substrate between <coughs> patients with infarct who had non-sustained VT, cardiac arrest, and VT. And conduction abnormalities are always much more than those with sustained monomorphic VT that is tolerated. This is the problem. You have a scar, you have channels through the scar, 
and you can have a myriad of different tachycardias <coughs> do that. And the ideal uh, ablation for like uniform tachycardia <coughs> would be to eliminate these channels. And uh, that's not so easy to do. Many years ago, um, we hypothesized that if you have an infarct and you have a scar, you should have a substrate for arrhythmias, and that substrate should involve slow conduction, and we thought that we could look at that by assessing the amplitude and duration of electrograms and late potential. Uh, we thought there were potential pathways of conduction bounded by either anatomical or functional areas of block. We thought the pressed excitability and dispersion of refractoriness, more appropriately dispersion of total recovery, which is activation time plus the local refractory period. And we wanted to think that areas of very delayed activation with short refractory periods would be important. And we thought if we could find the substrate and destroy it, we could prevent PT. Now, this began a long time ago, uh, at a time when people thought I was crazy, uh, because I was sticking catheters in the left ventricle. Uh, in the early 70s, there had only been two operations for VT, and uh, one was in England, the other was at Duke, patient's scleroderma. In both cases, there were epicardial maps and the QRF that was shown there was earlier than the earliest site, which was strange. So while I was invading the left ventricle, I noticed that patients who had very late activity, isolated late activity, that often became very early when they had tachycardia. <coughs> and this is an example in somebody with an anterior wall infarction. Here is somebody with an inferior wall infarction. Very delayed activation, way beyond the end of the QRF. And at the sites of these delayed activation when they had DT, it was activity that was either isolated or continuous throughout diastole. And that led to this silly paper of continuous electrical activity in which uh, if you see initiation uh, dependent upon uh, uh, continuous activity forming and perpetuation, and then both are needed for continuous activity, that meant something. These sites are less than a centimeter apart. Okay, These are four poles on a catheter, a distal and a proximal set of bipolar pairs. So in very small areas, you can find this as well. The initial experience looking at this was for the uh, exciting time. Uh, we mapped in those days with a typical barred catheter called the Josephson catheter. I think the stupidest thing I ever did, Jack, was not take a royalty for that catheter because it was for many years 85% of the world's catheters. I thought it would be uh, a conflict of interest. <laughs> How stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, using that catheter, and we used a five millimeter intellectual distance, and we also looked at it with one centimeter intellectual distance. And we looked at what was normal. So I think one of the things I will remind you is that anytime you want to find out what is normal, you need to make sure for every different kind of catheter you use, you need a normal set of values. So if you use an eight millimeter catheter, it's going to be different than this. If you're going to use a one millimeter uh, bipolar catheter, you need a whole set of new normals. This is what we found. And work uh, uh, from the human lab, we found normals uh, had more than three millivolts, as we said, and less than 70 milliseconds in duration. Abnormals, the amplitude got uh, lower. Fractionated, we needed to have multiple spikes. Late was after the QRS, and isolated and late was at least 50 milliseconds after the QRS was an isolated uh, isoelectric interval. And working with Andy Witt and the late John Finolio at Columbia, we had developed surgery at that time to deal with this pr uh, problem. And the section from which we cut out the and cured the tachycardia uh, had scar tissue. And within that scar tissue was embedded uh, viable fibers, channels, could be channels of myelite. So this seemed to be the common substrate of what we were seeing when we were doing surgery for VT and curing VT. What we found and what we cut out was viable myocytes embedded in scar. There were, in fact, some Purkinje fibers in those uh, tracings that were alive. Uh, but this was uniformly present at that time. This is uh, what I alluded to before, looking at non-sustained VT, cardiac arrest, and VT. And this is measuring by hand hundreds of electrograms in each patient. 
measuring the amplitude and width of each of them. And, and uh, what you see is basically the most abnormal are the VTs. The longest duration, uh, the endocardial activation is longest, the late potentials are greater. And that is a message to all of you that, that what determines the cycle length is conduction properties. What determines um, cycle length is not the head of uh, uh, a wavelength hitting the tail of another wavelength, but propagation time, conduction time, suggests that there is some uh, anatomic basis for this. My friend Jacques de Bakker, uh, who is able to analyze tissue in, or Langendorf preparations and parts that have been taken out of people, looked at human pathway muscles and indeed uh, saw this same mixture of content of fibers and myocytes and uh, noted the uh, really asynchronous uh, activation that he called zigzag activation. And this is again uh, zigzag because the myocytes are disconnected. The connections are in the wrong place. Even when you see them, they're not working. And this zigzag conduction, which was uh, necessary because the fibers, muscle fibers were separated by fibrous, fibrous tissue, is what caused the slow conduction and that continuous fragmented activity. And if you have that in sinus rhythm, you got uh, just what you need for re entity So what? So we can find all these abnormal electrograms and fractionated electrograms. Nothing about any kind of electrogram predicted where tachycardia is exited from. So we at the time of surgery, we looked at all of these findings, and yes, uh, tachycardia is 86% of the time came from abnormal sites, but it wasn't very often uh, predictive of the site of origin. The best we could do is about 30%. Longest electrograms we looked at, if we looked at fractionated and late, nothing really was useful. If we ablated what was abnormal, we would ablate a ton more than we needed to ablate. And uh, we didn't want to uh, hurt people. Uh, Gerard Gerardone, who had started trying to encircle all of this, uh, myocardium, I had a number of deaths, and Jimmy Cox at that time did an animal experiment which showed that when you did that, you killed off the muscle, uh, muscle uh, subjacent to the scar because you cut off the vascular supply to this. So we needed to be a little better. The surgical operating room was something that was a great boon to me uh, because it, it helped put things in perspective. Uh, we went to the operating room because of these activation findings that we we saw with the catheter. At that time, uh, Girard had first uh, done an encircling ventriculotomy, and then it was an endocardial ventriculotomy, so it wouldn't be so deep, and then ultimately an encircling cryoablation. We did a map guided subendocardial resection that John Gallagher dubbed the Pennsylvania Peel. Other people just cut out all the endocardial scar. And that cutting out all the endocardial scar or cutting out all the areas of fractionated electrogram had an 85% success. <coughs> and it was 85% over a longer period of time. In our map guided surgery, we had an 8% return rate of VT in five years and a 4% instance of sudden death. I don't think any, any other thing we do now can compete with that. This is what it looked like. We did an aneurysm ectomy. And uh, we, I used to have movies which showed the beating heart still in VT after the aneurysm was moved. And we took out this endocardial layer. We mapped around and we did that. This thing is like shoe level. And it's important because I'm trying to now see if we can image the channels. And I don't, it's hard for me to see viable muscle in there. And I'm not sure that we're going to be able to see that with current techniques in MR. But I think it's worth doing. Again, we did a mapping. Uh, series in the operating room using a different kind of electrode, and we got a different set of normals for that. And when we looked, and we, we found the same problem uh, as we found uh, with catheters. We looked at the distribution. So we had 12 segments, and we said how many segments, uh, how many patients had fractionated electrograms in different areas. And everybody had fractionated electrograms in all the segments and from all the distance from the center of any segment out. So they were all over the place. Uh, this particular study done by Mike Kinsley showed uh, in one tachycardia uh, there was a late there, but there was also late and long everywhere else. And this is a VT site here. And if you looked at the longest, latest split, and 
look at what's close and what's far from the VP. It, it's all over the place. So just like we saw with a catheter, and we were worried that, you know, it's a catheter and it's me saying, I was here in my mind's eye. In fact, in the operating room, we found the exact same thing. So substrate's important, 86% to 85% of the tachyoids go away when you get rid of all these electrograms. Um, we need to see if we need to get rid of all of them. And basically the conclusion that we had, these were associated with, but not specific markers for VT. We wanted to see what were we doing with the endocardial reception, and in fact, what were we recording and where were we recording it from. So what we did with John Miller was, um, and this is very important actually for those of you who do endocardial ablation, we did mapping with uh, this plaque, uh, and we placed it along the area of the region to be excited with a, a, a suture in it so we w it wouldn't move. We could flip it up and flip it down. We recorded after we resected it, and then we repositioned it at the same site. And this is sort of what we're talking about. We're, we did the aneurysmectomy. We're interested in here. We put the plaque there. We sewed it on. We cut it out. We put the plaque back. And we, then we put recorded to the plaque. So here's what the plaque looked like in this area uh, where we thought VT was coming from. In the next slide, I'll show you the VT comes from this area, okay? In this area where we have very fine mapping, we see lots of isolated late potentials. When we cut out the subendocardium and map it, and put the plaque right back down there, all of a sudden, A, no late potentials. So in that leather are islands of late potentials, okay? And what looks like Underneath that is almost much more normal electrograms, okay? However, if we put the plaque back on it, when we put the endocardial meat on back on top of that, we see the same kind of low amplitude signal that we saw in science. So that endocardial scar is sort of insulating what's beneath it. It houses the late potentials, but insulates the normal tissue, relatively normal tissue, that would die if we killed that as well. Okay? Here is just Another one where we have the VT, and we can see the late potentials all throughout diastole here. Here they are in sinus rhythm. Here again, after the subendocardial resection, they all go away. And this was actually proof of the concept that we had that these late potentials were important from the mapping both in the cath lab and in the operating room. We also looked at what we saw with the signal average ECG. Where did the late potentials come from on signal average ECG? And by and large, they all came from the endocardium. Epicardial late potentials were much less common than endocardial late potentials. So this, again, confirmed the site that what we were interested in was more subendocardial, and at least at that time, subendocardial resection and ultimately ablation from the endocardium made sense. You could complain about what we did. We had only 12 general sites in the ventricle, and no an online analysis own method of uh, determining what site we were talking about other than what I remember. And it was all manual measurement. So we needed a solution, and uh, so I went to Israel uh, with Sloan and Haim, and we put together the cartel. Uh, there was another possibility, uh, but we decided to move with cartel. So cartel is basically a, uh, a magnet, low magnetic field with some sensors in it that allow you to see in three-dimensional space where your electrode is. So if you record a signal, it puts on a map exactly where that signal is. Well, I don't have to remember in my mind. It's there for me. And you make a series of uh, maps in normal people and find out that most normal people have electrograms above 1.5 millivolts. Abnormal electrograms look sort of similar to the ones I showed you with a different kind of catheter, but uh, they're going to have different values. Remember, this was 3 millivolts in the first catheter map that I did. 0.5 millivolts correlated with scar in animals. So that we did with Leo Gepstein. So those of you who do molecular biology know about. Leo was in on the first part of uh, papers. Uh, and Dave Callens has been working in his So that's uh, the 0.5 correlates with a pretty dense scar. Now, pretty dense means different things. That shoe leather I showed you, when we were mapping, we didn't count anything until it was 0.1 millivolts. So that was our threshold 
with the leather. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. <coughs> what the scar we're talking about is correlates very well with the pe uh, a, uh, a spec imaging. So we have an inferior torsion, we have an inferior scar. And so we thought cardo was good because it would sort of mimic what the surgeon saw. What we're trying to do, in fact, in ablation and substrate ablation is sort of try to mimic what the surgeon did. I actually think we're going to bring the surgeons back in, but that's a tough act to uh, get accomplished. What we need to do is to map a whole lot in the ventricle and sinus rhythm or RV pacing, record the voltages, activation times, latent split potential, everything, and note adjacent sites of early and late activation. This is what at least the early edition of Carter could do that the newest one can't do, uh, where you can make activation maps, duration maps, and where were the, uh, the electric ends of longest duration. You can do a trade-off voltage map, and you can do an entrainment map if you had a tolerated VT. And you see that they correlate pretty well. The low amplitude voltage is much bigger than you need to kill, that the longest electric bands were somewhere in there, but the channel was also somewhere in there, but it was much less than what that whole red scar is. It, if you just wanted to say you could make a whole circle around all that scar and isolate the scar, you'd be fooling yourself. Yeah. Those of you who do atrial fibrillation ablation and make circles uh, know that the bigger the circle, the less likely it is to be successfully isolated. And second of all, the atrium is only a couple of millimeters thick. This is much thicker than that. And so there's going to be much more tissue underneath it that is going to be subjected to uh, isolation and death. So we don't want to do that. The other thing that I found uh, interesting were in sinus rhythm areas of uh, late and early activation being adjacent to one another. That became an area that uh, during uh, mapping um, was uh, important uh, in voltage <coughs> mapping. When we did voltage. There's an activation map. This is sort of that area of the the low voltage area where a tachycardia might come from. And in fact, in this particular patient, that's where excitation actually began and came around. So that's something to look at. So the dead score, I mentioned to you how we defined it. Uh, this, this was abnormal in our casting paper. We considered less than point millivolt dead score. Because we only Mac considered anything more than 0.1 millivolt useful for an activation. This is in bipolar recording. Bipolar recording. Okay. We didn't do unipolars because at that time when we used unipolar recording, they would basically be like cavity potential. They would overwhelm what you could see inside the heart. And I was not smart enough to look at tilted unipolars where I might have seen something, but I didn't at that time. Uh, Frank Marcinski uh, thought the 0.5 bipolar was dense score. And uh, he did that based on the animal study uh, from his uh, studies in humans. I continued uh, using 0.1 because it also correlated with thin world aneurysms in MRI that my play. So I still use 0.1. I don't think 0.5 is good enough. I think 0.5 contains lots of living tissue. Okay, so dense is different to different people. Depressed excitability, a high pacing threshold, okay? Excitability in the 80s we looked at in terms of fractionated electrograms. And we looked at strength interval curve. And the more the fractionated electric and the longer the duration, the lower the excitability. More recently, Bill Stevenson and Kyoko Kojima looked at stimulation of the heart and failure to capture the unipolar stimulation. <coughs> uh, totally different way to look at it, uh, but nonetheless a way to look at inexcitability. And if they couldn't pace it, they said it must be dead tissue. So that could be a scar, a border, a barrier for a channel. Uh, with that background, there were several methods that people used to identify things to ablate based on substance. So one thing might be mapping at the border zone. And border zone for me isn't where 0.5 goes to 1.5, but at the edge of 0.5, because I think 0.5 is the border, and everything is happening inside that. So you pace map along the border zone to identify exits and instances. What do I mean by that? Well, we do try to induce a tachycardia, even though it's fast, and we get tachycardia morphology. And then we pace around the dense area, at the inside the red but near where it ends, 
to see if we can find a QRS that approximates that and look at the stimulus to QRS. And then we move inside the scar to see if we can have the same morphology with the longer stimulus to QRS time. And that would identify potentially a channel for that morphology. We also learned that if you kept going in along the same line, you would produce a different morphology. And that led us to believe that you have a channel through this tissue, and if you're too far in the channel, you go at the other end. So this uh, is a useful piece of information. We're pacing at one site in a channel, or a, a legend <coughs> channel, gives you a stimulus of QRS that's long. As you move in, all of a sudden you will see a sudden lengthening of the stimulus of QRS and a different morphology. That suggests that the, both those QRS patterns share a common instance. So you do just what I told you. We pace along that border zone, and you make linear lesions. So this is sort of how we came up with that idea. So this was a VT. This was tolerated. This was entrained. So these are different sites of entrainment, not pace mapping. Pace mapping is sinus rhythm. So during entrainment, where you pace in the isthmus, there are certain criteria that must be met to identify a critical isthmus through which the uh, wave front must pass in order to uh, uh, activate the ventricle. That's where you want to oblate. And the pace map at the border, okay, at the border, and I've changed the voltage here. So this yellow used to be red, so I changed the scale, so it's not red any longer. It's because some of it's a lot, but only this area is red. This was a good pace map. And it was near the exit. So this is entrainment mapping. This is in the middle of the isthmus. This is near the exit. And there are some sites that are like here, which are outside the surface totally. So based on that, we did other things. We took another tachycardia like this. And again, the fallacy of this, or potential limitation of this, is we're basing our philosophy on what we know about tolerated tachycardia. And we're talking about untolerated tachycardia. Nonetheless, we would pace at this end of this red zone, and we would find a QRS that's similar to this with a stimulus to QRS delay. A stimulus to QRS delay is because you're really in what used to be red, and it takes time to get to normal tissue, which takes the QRS. To take it to the ultimate uh, extent, as I mentioned before, we would have a scar which re redefined instead of 1.5 to 0.5, we have 0 .0, 0 0.1 to 0.5. So this is totally different baseline, okay? And we see this being now 0.1, red is 0.1, and these were potential isthmuses. And when we pace near the exit for this tachycardia, right here, we have a short stimulus to QRS time and a pretty good match of the tachycardia. When I moved it back into the isthmus, I got the same morphology, but a longer stimulus to QRS. So I was moving back in this channel from this exit site to here. And that would identify an area through which I would make a linear ablation. These other areas were other pace maps for other tactic parties. The problem is there are lots of false negatives. Pacing in an isthmus, if you're really in the middle of the isthmus, you will more often than not get it QRS, it looks totally different in the tachycardia because the impulse is going in two directions in the channel. When you're pacing at an exit or during a tachycardia and training, it's only going in one direction. The isthmus could also be formed in part by functional barriers which aren't present in sinus rhythm, then you have a mess. And you can use too much current. When you're pacing in scar tissue, the tendency is to use a lot of current. A lot of current means you're pacing sites far from where you think you are. There are also false positives. You can uh, <coughs> get an identical QRS if you're in a dead-end pathway that's attached to an instance. That's not necessarily a good site to ablate. Or if you're pacing near the exit, but far from where it, the circuit really is. So outside where it first hits the normal tissue to make the QRS, but it's far away from where it's turning around inside that red area. This is just an example. Here is a tachycardia. This is actually the site of successful ablation, right in the center here. When I paced in the center of that isthmus, which is the absolute best site, with one lesion, first ablation, this is the first ablation I did at the Beth Israel Hospital. It was Paul's old patient, it was Christmas Eve. 
and it was nice because I gave one lesion and it was all done. But this patient, when I paced in that site, had a totally different QRF than the VT. But if I paced outside the exit, outside the exit, over here in sinus rhythm, the QRF was the same. So you can get totally fooled. This picture, which is a cartoon from Bill Stevenson, makes it easy to understand. In entrainment, okay, if you have this tachycardia, it's going in a circle. So it goes this way and this way. If I stimulate here, I go out the same way the tachycardia is. So the QRS and the tachycardia are the same. But if I stimulate here in sinus rhythm, I go out this way, this way, and this way, and the QRS has to be different. So this is the major limitation of this uh, type of uh, <coughs> sort of pace mapping. And if you know that that's a limitation, you know that maybe it could be used to your advantage to identify other channels uh, that exit from the center of that scar. I mentioned I like to redefine voltage windows to define uh, wi uh, channels. So here is a patient who had the initial uh, setting, as Dr. Marsonsky suggested, and pretty much everybody uses, 0.5 to 1.5. 1.5 being normal, 0.5 being dense scar. As I mentioned to you, I don't believe dense scar is dense scar. I think there are living cells in here. So what I do is say, 0.5 is the end of normal for this particular part of my reasoning, and everything else lower than 0.1 is abnormal. <coughs> and then you look at this red thing, this big red thing, and you see, well, this is really dead, this is really dead, but I have potential channels through that really dead area here and here. And I cross them as a way to block a channel. I put lesions across them. This is the first group of people who prospectively did that. Uh, Jesus Almondral, one of my fellows in Spain laboratory, uh, did the same thing. They changed the voltage window, they found the big isthmus, and they looked at that, and a number of people with ablations across that with uh, good uh, success in follow-up. Good success, by the way, in ablation isn't equal to cure. cure. Good success is not cure, doesn't equal cure. Curing disease that causes a scar like this takes more than an ablation. The problem with lowering the voltage is that some channels are small and might, may not even be detected if <coughs> insufficient sampling is done. Some viable myocytes give rise to signals less than 0.1, so 0.1 may not be good enough. Some small channels may uh, be obscured by adjacent high voltage signals. So if you look at a signal, and there's a, an adjacent normal piece of tissue, part of it just sees the normal tissue and it calls it normal. So that would be some place that you not really want to look at. And this whole hypothesis is based, as I mentioned to you, on what we know from tolerated people. It's got to be considered a limitation. Not unbearable, but a limitation. Pacing could define the inexcitable area. Instead of changing the voltage to 0.1, what about pacing? I told you Bill Stevenson uh, likes to do 10 millivolt, uh, uh, 10 millivolt uh, milliamp capture or lack of capture, we found that inexcitability was directly related to electrogram duration, which, uh, which is of interest because when Stevenson looked at the bipolar amplitude and looked at excitability, at 0.5, which was considered dense scar, half the sites were fully excitable. So even based on this technique, there was viable muscle, aside from the fact he may have been capturing far field, there could have been viable muscle. The interesting thing is when he got to 0.1 millivolt amplitude, it was pretty much inexcitable. So it was of interest and just coincidence that 0.1 millivolt and inexcitability seem to correlate with uh, one, one another. This is what he did. His area of inexcitability is electrically and inex unexcitable tissue. Uh, he then made scar out of those sites and did lesions to cross and connect the two scars. You all here know about virtual electrodes, and the higher the current used, the bigger the area that is uh, polarized, and part of the problem is, as you pace with higher and higher currents, your virtual electrode becomes bigger, and you start capturing distant tissue. Aside from 
overcalling excitable tissue because of the large virtual electrodes, there's no proof of the accuracy to detect an anatomic barrier because fibers may be really tiny. Fibers may be less than 0.1 millivolts. The catheter tip is three and a half or four millimeters. So it's not clear that we uh, can capture that tissue that's embedded in the scar. We, we don't know if we can do that. So that. That's a limitation. I also think it's very time consuming. And you have to be so precise, you have to every couple of millimeters show inexcitability. The virtual electrode exceeds that. So I think it's a very big problem. That's the major limitation of that. The most important thing, that was actually the first thing I talked <coughs> about to you uh, from catheter mapping in the 70s, was the idea of split potentials and late potentials to define the, these barriers. I never quite believed that a split potential, uh, which would be uh, two potentials with, say, 50 milliseconds in between, but that's all, necessarily means block. It could be a bordered reentry around a scar, it could be wavefront in two different directions on either side of the scar, or it could be blocked, or it could be blocked. But th that's uh, the potential of that. So if you want the best thing to do is to look for isolated late potential, things that occur well after the QRS following an isoelectric image. And then you pace those areas. And here is an isolated late potential, okay? And notice that there's poor excitability here because pacing actually produces block in that area. But when you do capture, you produce a QRS with a long stimulus to QRS, and it can be pretty close to one or more tachycardia. If you move it a little bit, you may see another tachycardia. So if you see an isolated potential, and you see this, I think you're really in a channel. And what you do is what we like to do is take a map, make your voltage, set it, whatever you want, and have enough recordings to pick up as many late potentials as you can to the scar and then ablate them and record what happens when you ablate the late potential. What happens is not only does the local late potential go away, but sometimes several late potentials go away, which is further support that the late potentials are actually identifying a channel of activation. If you get the channel at its origin, you get everything downstream as well. Not so easy to do, okay? Nonetheless, again, from Hayes and group, uh, they did a prospective study looking at these late potentials, and they had a 13 out of 18 patients with no VT. Now, they think that's great. We would all like that to be 18 out of 18. You're dealing with very sick people, and I, this is just a start. People are just starting to do this, uh, and you need to know how big a lesion do you need to make at this site? How long should you leave the... Uh, the current on. Are you using a cool tip catheter or are you using a, a four millimeter catheter? So these things influence the lesion that you make. Split potentials, as I mentioned, don't always mean block. They may be functional and dependent on the direction of wavefront. So that's a potential limitation. Late potentials are very widespread and may not only be an arrhythmogenic site. They may be delayed and late and totally unrelated to anything. They may be dead in pathways. Late potentials may require the development of functional blocks. If that were so, you may not see that in sinus rhythm. It's interesting, I was looking at some tracing uh, on the uh, ECG of, of urine and also in other ECGs, and there's a line of block that is created uh, that's a late line of block in pacing of the RV apex. I'm not so sure why that happens, but if that's a functional line of block, it could produce this and it may not be there in sinus rhythm, then what does that late potential mean? I don't know. And I think that if you're gonna use late potentials, which I think would be useful, you have to map hundreds of sites in order to make this really useful. Because all the late potentials gotta go away. With that being said, I go back to surgery, okay? And I look at a patient with four tachycardias, and we mapped them all, and this is the scar. The scar is usually very big, much bigger than really where you want to ablate. But here we have two of the tachycardias came from the areas outside visible scar, outside areas with abnormal electrograms. So these were deeper. These are things that you won't see with the late potentials or any other endocardial mapping that I mentioned. And these are the kinds of cases where the epicardium may be very important. Turns out in coronary disease, only less than 5% of the time you will meet the 
to go to the epicardium, and it's much more common in inferior infarctions than in anterior infarctions. So, first conclusion, that, that although a substrate can be identified, ablation using multiple parameters would be necessary to eliminate all disease. I don't know if that should always be the goal. It's unknown whether you need to eliminate all of these to have a successful outcome. Okay? In surgery, we didn't remove all of the scar in our lab. We mapped and wanted to figure out what was mappable. And we also found that we, if we induced these very fast things afterwards and the cycle length was 50 milliseconds faster than our own, there was no recurrence of that. So just because you can induce something doesn't mean it's going to happen. And what about VF, or non-inducible arrhythmia, and some only clinical VF? Then you have to do empiric sorts of ablation. The other limitation, despite these questions, we did a small randomized study called SMASH-VT, in which we took patients who had got devices for secondary prevention, so they had syncope and VT induced, or documented VF and VT, and we randomized them to ablation, which is standard 18 of the beta blocker, et cetera. And we did a pretty good job. Uh, we did this because ICDs are less than perfect, okay? 30 to 50 percent of people who have shocks have inappropriate shocks. 20 percent will get shocks. There's a decrease in quality of life and decrease in physical capacity after ICD shocks, particularly multiple. There's an increase in hospitalizations for heart failure and mortality related to shocks. We saw in dynamite study there was an increase in non-sudden mortality in patients with shocks. The same thing in scud there was almost a five-fold increase in mortality in those who got shocks. And again, in MADD2, 31% uh, of all shocks were inappropriate and it increased mortality and heart failure. So we don't want shocks. So I think it is important to not have shocks and not have events. And that's why we did this study. And the study was pretty amazing. We did these same procedures that I told you about, uh, mapping, case mapping, late potential. And what we did it basically, Vivek Reddy was the MGH center. He enrolled one patient from the MGH, and everybody else was in Czechoslovakia, and our center. It was only really a two-center study. And what we found was that there was a, a great improvement in appropriate ICG, either shocks or ATP, or total shocks. It was 70% reduction in shocks. And there was a trend to decrease mortality. We had no significant harm to our patients. There was no change in ejection fraction. And this has led us to want to think about doing a bigger study. Is this my standard of care for documented cardiac arrest patients? No, should it be? Maybe. Um, I think your choices are going to be to prevent shocks, amiodarone with its attendant side effects, or sodalol with its attendant inefficacy and side effects, uh, or doing this. The fact that it was safe in our hands means it might be my, my fine for me to do, but is it fine for everybody to do? Will it ever be a class one indication? I doubt it. We can't get electrophysiologists to do simulations to see if you need an ICD, much less mapping them to do uh, a systematic approach to this. I think in labs where there are still electrophysiologists, and I distinguish electrophysiologists from ablationists and defibrillationists, where there are still electrophysiologists, this thing may be useful. And we need to go further, because I think this is a way we'll prevent shocks, this is a way we'll improve long-term survival. But as you know, as a result of the surgery event, where we prevented VT, we would have prevented, prevented shock. 50% were dead in five to six years. They died of heart failure. So we shouldn't be thinking of curing disease. We should be thinking of palliation and increasing quality of life. And I wish everybody here has a long and healthy and high quality life. Thank you very much. Well, this uh, talk is open for discussion. Any questions, or comments? Quiet. Yeah. So, Dr. Josephson, you, you hinted at how you would bring the surgeons back um, to, to help.
help this out. I, surely it's not go backwards and do it all over like we, you were doing in the 70s and 80s. But yeah, it is. Yeah, it is, but learning more. I, I think that the best procedure we have to treat these was surgery. I think I learned more in the operating room because I saw things. I was able to correlate visually and anatomically uh, what I was finding electrically. I could also take care of the epicardium from the surgical standpoint. Not so easy with prior cabbage surgery or, uh, or other surgery uh, uh, in the cath lab. And so, yes, before I leave Boston, I'm going to reinvent surgical VT ablation again. I think that we should go back to that. We haven't done any better. We don't need to always use new toys to get better results. We need to use our brains better. Okay, and we need to learn more. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big supporter of learning more. And I think for me, I can learn more in the operating room and have better results than in the cath lab. And I'm saying that as an electrophysiologist, not an ablation. I'm going to ask you about mechanoelectric feedback. You're, you're, you had that slide just before the end where you had uh, scar, mm -hmm. and then the two red spots outside the scar. Yeah. And so, so that's the question, which is, or even within the scar, do you think the mechanoelectric feedback plays a role, and is there a way to assess it or anything? I, I think it's really hard. In the scar, there's not much mechano going on. Uh, <laughs> Well, but it's being, I mean, if you put a strain gauge in the scar yeah. with every systole and diastole, it's, it's stretched. It's stretched. stretched. I agree that it's stretched, but there doesn't seem to be triggers in there. It's actually easier to induce that reentrant arrhythmia from outside the scar than from inside the scar. Okay, and that's because inside the scar you might have longer refractory periods, and when you stimulate, it's easy to get out. Harder to produce blocks in some cases. Outside in, you block at the entrance to a channel and then go around in another channel. I don't think that it's a cause for stuff in the scar. It may be what causes <coughs> triggers. So we're talking about other mechanisms for triggers. And if you think of tachycardia as being due to triggers and substrate, I think mechano feedback, electrical feedback, or other kinds of mechanisms for trigger activity, particularly delayed after depolarizations, are an important trigger for you. I think those other deep <coughs> sites that we saw were related to epicardial sites. What we did was a study that we never published, a sad story for most of us, uh, is that at those sites where we ultimately uh, believed that by ECG morphology, tachycardia should come from, when we gave double or triple extra stimuli, those sites that were normal became very fragmented. Um, so I think they can be stressed on the inside, but I would bet they'd be found on the outside. And I think that epicardial approach to those people would be okay. I think it's much easier to do an epicardial and endocardial approach in the operating room in just as little time as it takes you to get the general anesthesia people to your cash lab <laughs> to do a fancy system, you know, put an impeller in or a tandem heart in uh, so you, uh, a patient doesn't die in the cash lab. Do an epicardial and endocardial approach. That surgery would be done. You'd have a better outcome. You'd have bypass too. You would have to put a stent in, you know, or three or four stents, you know. You know, anytime the cath guy sees a, a vessel that's a little bit narrowed, you know, I think a stent goes in. I think, uh, I'm, I'm for going back to basics. I think we've lost our way a little bit. I think we've become, uh, we've fallen in love with technology instead of knowledge. I'm a critic, huh? <laughs> yeah. Has, has the substrate changed? Yeah. In the sense that um, back when you first started doing VT ablations, people had transmural ablations. Nowadays, people, you know, they don't complete their infarcts. Yeah. Does that make it easier or harder to go back to? I think it makes it, it, it <coughs> apparently makes it harder. I think the substrate has changed. There's less of these giant infarcts. Path pathophysiology is the same. You become those smaller guys in the in the DFRS that we map, so only instead of 42%, 30% will have scar, okay? But the, the, the way things work is probably the same. There are more potential circuits, maybe, because there are more islands of disconnected uh, dead areas than 
a large uh, area. So I think that that's true, but that's what we have to learn. I don't think we're going to learn it so well in the, in the cash lab. I think there's still big scars. You know, if you want to have a big scar, go to the VA. You know, anyone who wants to do great mapping and take care of salary, go to the VA. Or go to, you know, elsewhere in the world. Uh, I think most of us are, uh, have 24-7 interventional laboratories where people don't get, we're, what we're doing is aborting these insults and these people don't get. So that's part of the reason why we have a much lower incidence of sudden death is because we're eliminating formation. But the people who wind up getting arrest have the same problem. Maybe not quite as large as dense scar, but the same physiology, I think. But I think that's, again, what you can learn in the OR. And I'd invite Jack to help me. <laughs> any, other, any other questions? Any surgeons in the audience? <laughs> All right, thanks, Mark. Thank you.